Okay, so we want to welcome everyone to Environmental Fridays. It is personal. This is season five of Environmental Fridays. And at the bottom, uh, you see our link to all of the speakers, the schedules, and their bios um, for this season. And in fact, for the entire year, season five and season six. Uh, so that's the link. And to the right is a QR code that would get you to that site. Um, so uh, if you wish, you can look it up um, either, either way. Um, so this season, I've been having us take a look at what is referred to as one of the most iconic photos of uh, human history, which is a photograph taken by an Apollo astronaut um, showing, and you could see in the foreground, the uh, moon surface. In the background is the blue planet. That's our home. And we wanted to um, bring this up uh, on a regular basis during season five to keep reminding us of our home, our blue planet. And um, it's it's one of the things that actually started the environmental movement, at least triggered the environmental movement, and also inspired um, the observ observance of Earth Day. So I think we're all familiar with Earth Day. This, photo has a lot to do with that. If you want to learn some more information about Earthrise, that's the name of this photo, you could um, also look at that QR code where you could be linked to a video that, um, a video interview, a YouTube interview of the photographer, of the astronaut who took this uh, picture. This morning, my reflection on this picture is that we really have two choices. One is ruination and the other is restoration. Those are our two choices um, in how we treat our home. And I hope that we have the faith to see beyond the problems that we have the ruins that we have in terms of pollution, biodiversity loss, and climate and the climate crisis. We have to have faith that we can see beyond and go beyond what is uh, present um, from ruination to restoration. So that's my thoughts on this photo this morning. Today, we have the privilege of hearing from Mr. Keith Picard. He is a science teacher in the Allendale Public Schools in Allendale, Michigan, and he's an adjunct uh, biology professor at Grand Valley State University. He obtained his uh, bachelor's and master's in biology from Grand Valley State University. And he is the creator and founder of RAIL, the RAIL project. He will, RAIL is an acronym and he will explain that all to you uh, today. So it's a privilege to have you on here with us today, uh, Keith. So I'll stop sharing now and you yeah. could Actually, yes. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Desmond. All right. So, um, as Desmond said, um, yeah, I am uh, the creator, the founder of the Rail Project. Um, it is an acronym for Riparian Area Integrated Learning. Um, short end of it, um, it is a um, it's a curriculum um, all the way from kindergarten on up through college. Um, and is now starting to extend out into um, citizen science theory as well, uh, which I'll get into uh, later on with my talk. But um, it is my goal with this whole project is to immerse 
the user, whether it be the student, whether it be uh, somebody just curious about uh, their uh, their stream in their backyard or uh, drainage ditch uh, uh, next to the road. Um, get them immersed into real hands-on inquiry-based science, but then at the same time, contributing data to a larger, larger data set that is used authentically by um, scientists from uh, state, federal, um, environmental agencies, universities um, around the country, the United States, and even one uh, down in Brazil, too, uh, that works with our stuff. Um, so uh, going into this, um, this uh, this quote, um, selfishly, I I uh, pulled it from one of my publications about it, but it, it kind of in, encapsulates my whole teaching philosophy. Um, where the success of activities lies in the joy of discovery. And that's science, that's science education. I don't care what field of science it is. I just use ecology and aquatic ecology um, to trap those students uh, into the discovery. But uh, students in science, um, they're going to find that not all of the answers are found in the back of the book. Um, one of my favorite uh, answers I always give to my students uh, when they're asking me, well, hey, I, I don't quite understand this. Um, my data showing this. And I say, well, I don't know. What do you think? Um, and that's that's just so, so, so important. Um, it also it builds resilience up in the students that, you know what? Put yourself out there. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. Um, but in science, we have never, ever, ever proven any hypothesis true. So it just... Uh, collecting evidence to support that um, hypothesis. Um, so if you've never heard of an aquatic macroinvertebrate before, yet 7% of the 91,000 insect species that we have in just North America alone, they are either aquatic or semi-aquatic. Uh, you're gonna find them in any, any sort of uh, waterway, uh, anything from um, streams, rivers, um, uh, your ephemeral ponds, so those are just your temporary ponds, you know, a good hard heavy rain or snow melt that fill in whatnot, good place to look for fairy shrimp. Um, but um, any, anywhere there's water, you can find these aquatic macroinvertebrates. Um, and the story, the story that they're uh, able to tell you about um, the environment, about the ecology, about the processes, about certain impacts that are made in um, streams and um, by the surrounding area is just amazing. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about. Um, so back to what are aquatic macroinvertebrates? Well, the invertebrate gives it away. They do um, lack an internal skeleton. They do not have a, um, a backbone. The macro uh, insinuates that yet yeah, you uh, can see them without the aid of a microscope. So it's really, really interesting. Just go out in the water pick something up and just look at what you got and then uh, see the story um, that they can tell. Now they include any sort of arthropod um, that is uh, aquatic, arthro joint, pod legs. Um, so your arthropods like your aquatic insects, whether it be your coleopters or hymenopteras, your beetles or your true bugs um, in all of their life cycles. So nymph stage, larval stage, pupae, um, adult, um, and it also includes um, your mollusk and um, your worms, so things like your snails, uh, your bivalves, clams, and such. Um, again, so it's pretty eclectic array of just things that uh, live in the water. Uh, they lack a backbone, um, and they live part to sometimes most of their uh, life cycle in the water. So aside from living in the water, let's get a little bit more in detail about where those aquatic macroinvertebrates live. Um, and again, on the slideshow, I have, you know, factors to consider, the necessary habit, uh, the food availability, the appropriate water conditions, and the size of the waterway. So I uh, mentioned on that, so the habitat, again, if and if you can think of how I'm presenting this, just keep in the back of your mind, resources dictate population. And so with the necessary habitat, if I'm finding a lot of invertebrates in this uh, stream or river that are dependent on hard, flat surfaces, things like um, rocks, boulders, cobble, and whatnot, 
and that's predominantly what I'm getting. Well, then even just looking at the data without even having to be in the stream or river, I can probably tell you it's not a sandy substrate. Whereas if I got something that's a burrower and I don't have a whole lot of your clinging invertebrates that need that hard surface, um, then again, it's going to be telling me something about um, the substrate of that stream or river. But then even cooler because I can know something about the substrate, I can then go ahead and start to make um, guesses about how susceptible that system is to particular disturbances, like whether it be somebody's uh, doing some landscape project upstream or whatnot. Um, so that leads me now into my, my big focus of what I um, was hitting with invertebrates in uh, grad school and what... Um, what the rail project was really, really focused on for uh, um, a good chunk of time, and that's the river continuum concept. So the river continuum concept, and you might have seen this diagram in um, ecology books all over, but once you can understand how invertebrates behave, and especially the feeding behavior, um, that's going to tell you where the food source is coming in to the aquatic system, is it dependent on leaf litter? Is it dependent on the algae that's growing in the stream? So is it a heterotrophic system, food falls in? Is it an autotrophic system where food is growing in stream? And then once that energy comes in, how does it get metabolized as it moves downstream? And that whole river continuum concept and based on ratios of particular functional feeding groups, your functional feeding groups are um, the primary way that an aquatic invertebrate gets food, okay? Is it a shredder eating leaf litter? Is it a scraper eating algae? Is it a filtering collector where it needs already processed food, but that water has to be carrying that food with it? Or is it a gathering collector where that same processed food it's got to settle to the bottom, which would indicate slower moving water. So they're crawling around getting the, the food from there. So knowing the insect feeding habits or macroinvertebrate feeding habits, and um, based on that, then the whole river continue, uh, continuum concept, I can then start to make predictions. Okay, well, this order stream, like your headwaters and whatnot, that are mostly, mostly, mostly dependent on food falling in. Okay, well, if I have predominantly shredders, I'm more than likely going to have a first order stream. Whereas you look at something like the Mississippi River, if you've ever seen the Mississippi River in person, it looks almost like chocolate milk. And that chocolate milk, it's not chocolate milk, but it's all the, the broken down organic matter from all of the tributaries and the needle streams feeding into those tributaries all getting broken down and then suspended in the form of fine particular organic matter and dissolved uh, particular organic matter. So looking at something like the Mississippi, which is about a seventh, eighth order stream, you're going to have a lot of collectors, a lot of collectors, and you'll have your typical predators too, but mostly. So that's the river continuum concept where you're able to predict where the food is getting metabolized, how it's getting metabolized as you move through. So Again, why, why is river continuum uh, important? It focuses like what I hit on, on your food conditions, the habitat conditions, but again, it can tell you so much in the way of how the energy gets in and how that energy gets um, transferred from one trophic level to the next trophic level to the next trophic level, all the way up to your fish. Um, it's interesting. So Keith, why do you care so much about macroinvertebrates? Why not just take the students out or take the community members out and just measure the chemistry, the dissolved oxygen, the alkalinity, the um, whatever else? And here's why. So macroinvertebrates, they're so, so, so um, intriguing because they can identify those water quality parameters as well, but they have to be in the water and they're in that water continuously. So instead of just giving a snapshot of what the water conditions are, if I go out and I measure like what I say in my dissolved oxygen, nitrates, orthophosphates, this and that, well, that's just one snapshot of the time in that stream. Maybe I get a peak of nitrates because um, 
they were fertilizing the lawns upstream and then we had a hard, hard, hard rain. So it carried all the nitrates and orthophosphates into the water. Well, just because that one piece of data shows an increase in nitrates and phosphates, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's always that. Whereas looking at the invertebrates that are laid in the stream or river or pond, whatever you're going to be looking at, and they hatch and then develop in there, they're in there for a continuous, continuous, continuous amount of time. And because of that, because of that, they have to be exposed to the water conditions, the longitudinal water conditions. And once you can understand that concept, then I can figure out why a biological testing of looking at macroinvertebrates is so, so, so much more valuable to indicating water quality uh, than just your regular basic um, testing for dissolved oxygen, nitrates, phosphates, pH, t uh, total dissolved solids, conductivity, and on and on and on and on. So um, what I'm going to be getting into now is um, the rail project. I, this sounds interesting. Invertebrates are awesome, awesome, awesome. How can I implement it? And how I'm going to be explaining this is um, I'm going to be presenting it by looking at the elements of place-based stewardship education. So I want to do this with my students. I want to do this with my university, or I want to do it as a, um, as a citizen. So I'm going to give you the steps, the walkthrough on this, and then the tools uh, where you can implement this. So how to implement the rail project. Again, we're going to break it down based on the place-based stewardship um, steps, okay? So that first uh, element of the place-based stewardship is scanning the community. And again, this is really, really, really simple. Just step outside and go find your aquatic system, okay? Um, if you're in the inner city, guess what? Stormwater has to drain somewhere. There's puddles somewhere. If you're out in agriculture, oh my goodness, the story that uh, the surface water and running into your streams can tell you uh, due to agriculture. It's fantastic. But the important, the important thing is to identify a good, good, good option that's local to your area, the local ecology, and that it's meaningful, okay? And when you do that, it's gonna bring up the student's awareness of particular environmental issues in that community, okay? Um, and we can go on and on from all the way up in Rockford with PFAS and whatnot uh, to over uh, north uh, west of us with uh, like Ice Mountain um, and the Nestle uh, water bottling plant and such, again, there's there's a story to be told from your drainage ditches to your streams, creeks, et cetera, okay? Let the brainstorming begin. And even if it's just collecting data, I don't see a particular issue, collect the data and let the data speak for itself. All right, so just some quick examples. Um, these um, are just uh, some pictures I took from um, when I uh, led a, a similar uh, workshop in uh, Grand Rapids and uh, the schools and the teachers, um, they were right in downtown Grand Rapids. And in this case, I said, all right, well, let's go out to um, walk out from the um, where we're presenting at and uh, take a look at this, uh, this stream. And this right here is uh, Plaster Creek. It's downstream um, from uh, Grand Rapids Airport. And uh, Grand Rapids Airport was on uh, the news because, yep, PFAS uh, over there. And I just said, okay, guys, here it is. Here's an aerial shot of it. It's right um, tiled underneath a very, very, very well-developed area of 28th Street in Grand Rapids. Um, what do you think? Um, what sort of story can the invertebrates tell? What do you think we could find in here, what sort of macroinvertebrates? You know, are we going to find invertebrates that need a lot of dissolved oxygen? Are we going to find very, very pollution, pollutant intolerant invertebrates? What do you guys find? So again, what I'm getting to is, yep, you can have something as simple as just a drainage culvert uh, tiled underneath uh, 28th Street. Okay, it's there. Now the other extreme end. Um, a number of years ago, I was 
given the same presentation on the rail project out in Los Angeles. And um, for that presentation, I went out um, up into uh, uh, the mountains, the Sierra Nevada mountain range and um, pulled some invertebrates. So uh, this right here is um, up on Mount Baldy and um, we're looking at the San Antonio Creek and downstream, way, way, way downstream, you can see Los Angeles off in the distance. But um, just looking at this, you know, what sort of ecological story, whether it be water quality index, whether it be stream ecosystem attributes, I'll get into what those guys are uh, later on. But just based off of this, what stories are to be told? Where's the energy coming from? Um, is it dependent on sunlight and in-stream organic matter growing in there? Or is it dependent on the input of organic matter? Um, and so I, I led that conference with just showing this picture first. I'm like, what story do you do you have? I, of course, uh, brought back invertebrates and uh, let them then figure out what that story was. So the next slide actually was uh, some things that we sampled. So if these uh, numbers seem uh, Greek to you, the hydrocycid, uh, the philopomodidae, uh, leptophilidae, perlidae, can't, basically, let me walk you through this. So the hydrocycid, they're the net spinning caddis. Um, the philopotamidae, those are your finger net spinning caddis. Um, the perlidae, that's a stonefly. Um, here, the leptophilidae, the prong guild um, mayfly. But looking at this just off the um, basis, okay, caddisfly, mayfly, um, stonefly, right away, right away, looking at these, I know that those organisms are indicators of good water quality. Why? They need a lot of dissolved oxygen. So if the dissolved oxygen is there, it's a good indicator that it's not a polluted stream. Um, and I'll get into helping you. Well, how do I know if it needs a lot of oxygen? How do I know this and that? I'll walk you through it. My app does it for the user. So the next element, the next element is choosing an issue. So after the users go out and they're like, hey, we found this drainage ditch. And you know what? The water has this weird smell to it. And there looks like there's something seeping from the uh, from the ground. Maybe there was an old dump. So you get some um, iron oxide seeping. In. It'll be a nice brownish color coming into the water, you know. So have the students choose an issue and then connect it to the curriculum. And I can help with that. My um, my curriculum, I already wrote it for you guys. Um, it's paired up, NGSS friendly. Um, for my educators out there, you should know what NGSS is. It's our the national uh, science curriculum. And then start to figure out, well, what sort of partners, what business partners, what environmental agencies are out there that can help us, okay? So quick background of the rail. This thing, yeah, it started um, back in 2000, um, back when Allendale Public Schools was building uh, an elementary school and um, uh, DEQ, Department of Environmental Quality, it's now Eagle, um, at the time said, okay, Allendale Public Schools, you can build this school, but, but uh, on the condition you have to dig these retaining ponds or retention ponds, and then you have to have it flow into an overflow old irrigation pond and essentially be a buffer for any surface water runoff, parking lot runoff water before it enters into um, the Sevy Dream, which is a state protected riparian zone on our campus. So started in 2000 with just collecting baseline data, uh, water quality parameters, macroinvertebrates upstream from school um, as the water first enters into the campus at each one of the ponds to because that's where we were looking for where we should get the fluctuation in between the ponds in case the system sprung a leak and then as water leaves uh, campus basically we're just comparing if the water enters in and leaves the same and public schools does a good job with this that then um, started um, in with uh, 2001 and 2 where we continued the baseline data but then um, I brought it into the classroom in 2002, 2003, where, you know, I started having the students doing all the monitoring, the students doing the reporting. 
And um, that caught wind with, you know, well, how do I find these partnerships? Uh, University of Michigan heard about it, their Sea Grants department. And with that, we then began to um, report to um, authentic, authentic scientists and where the students start to get, uh, start to get feedback from there. Um, we began, um, became, um, I'm sorry, uh, began being part of the biennial report of Michigan water quality that every other year has to get sent off to the federal government again. So my students were like that data, that's mine. And that's that authentic piece to it. Um, then in 2006, I had a student, well, actually in 2005, a student said, hey, uh, Picard, why are there so many of this invertebrate, um, the um, scud uh, is what it is. And so I'm like, hey, you know what? Good question. Let's find out. And so the problem, uh, the project morphed into um, the same data we were collecting, but we focused our um, analysis on looking at the gamma's fasciatus and why it's the most abundant macroinvertebrate in the Seve drain. And come to find out, it's also one of the most abundant macroinvertebrates in Northwest United States. And the whole reason for it, it turned into a feeding study. It's because it could feed on so many different resources. So it could never get outcompeted, uh, really. Pretty, pretty interesting thing. So that went for a number of years. Then we started caught wind with another uh, university down in uh, Pennsylvania, so Allegheny College, and um, we've been partnered with them for a long, long time now, since 2007, and we stuck with the feeding then, and then I got the students into, well, you know what, since we're focused on the feeding of this invertebrate, let's use all of the feedings and start to identify the metabolic pathways in the system. How's the food getting in? How's it um, moving downstream? Going back to the um, river continuum concept. After that, we kept, and we still measure the uh, feeding behavior and we still measure the um, metabolic pathways, but then it went into, um, we had the opportunity to uh, release salmon into uh, the Seve drain. So we wanted to see, well, we're introducing a um, a new apex predator. We already have 20 years worth of uh, baseline data. Let's see if that introduction of salmon into the Seve drain uh, that does tie eventually into the Grand River. So it's not just a ditch. Um, but we wanted to see, well, how is that going to impact the biodiversity of the stream? So last year was all baseline data. Uh, we released uh, the salmon into the Seve drain um, in spring of last year. And this year we're continuing with just identifying the um, Simpson index biodiversity. So using our macroinvertebrate data we have already, and we're focused on looking at the biodiversity. And again, through this whole 23 years of the rail project so far, again, the doors are always, always open for my students and myself too, to present this to a larger audience. It's the authentic science piece that's so, so, so valuable to the students. And it just makes the project more robust, more robust, more robust. And then the students, oh, they buy in so much when I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna give you guys a grade on it, but grade aside, um, I already signed us up to present at a conference. We have one coming up in November actually. Um, we're presenting their scientists that are going to be there. And when they have to defend their research, their findings and their conclusions to your PhDs and whatnot, oh, it just, it brings science to a whole other level. And that's, it's that authentic piece that that's the best part of science. So there's the background. And like what I alluded to, well, going back to those elements it's developing those partnerships, developing those partnerships. So again, the community partners, they can offer the knowledge, the expertise, it's outside of the classroom and whatnot. They're, they're the ones getting their hands dirty in whatever field it is on that. And when you're doing that, developing the partnership, again, here's uh, just a handful of the partners uh, that our research is partnered with. But as you're giving the authentic experience and letting the students present and share their findings with the public, those partnerships just form organically. And I, to be honest, it wasn't like I just sent out uh, emails, hey, look at my uh, my project I'm having my students do, what do you think? 
I just sign up to go speak at conferences. And then when um, Eagle then approaches me like, oh, so your Grand Valley students are doing this? I'm like, nope. Uh, sixth graders from Allendale Middle School are actually doing it. They're like, whoa, okay, I didn't hit that until grad school and whatnot. So again, giving the students the authentic science piece and then letting them present to it, it kind of just organically builds that partnership up with it. So to wrap up the um, the rest of the elements, so yep, element four, researching the issue. Get the students, you know, getting into, all right, well, aside from just let's go sample water out of a stream, let's figure out, well, where's that water coming from? Are there any issues um, newsworthy-wise that are impacting that? Or is there some issues that should be newsworthy Wise, uh, like a couple of years ago, we made the news because of uh, some leaky septic uh, systems we found in Jenison. Oops, but it was fantastic because it was middle school students from Jenison using the rail project to present it at uh, city council meetings. It was the coolest thing. Um, we ended up finding funding so we could get those uh, septic tanks uh, replaced. But it was just, again, couldn't predict it. It's what the data showed. We presented it and that's what it was. Um, element five, complete the action project. So again, as a teacher, as an educator, you know, once you get it, like what I was saying, don't just, well, hey, we did our authentic piece. We played around in a stream. Again, you should have a project and I can help with that. I already have the curriculum written up for anybody that wants to use it um, to get it going so that it's organized and that the students know what they're getting into and what the outcomes are going to be. So have those learning targets ready. Um, be consistent with them. And then element six, share those results. It's that authentic piece. It's that authentic piece. It is so, so, so valuable uh, getting authentic science into the students. They buy into it. And once they do that, you can raise the bar in your classroom because they know if I've already done that, I can hit this. I can hit that. I can hit that. And as an educator, you've got to continually be raising the bar for your students because they can reach it and it builds resilience. So for uh, the viewers out there, this sounds awesome, but you know what? I am not confident with my macroinvertebrate ID skills, okay? Um, interesting, um, it's not bad, uh, but to make it super easy, um, that's why I created this app that I'm gonna be uh, walking through uh, with you guys. And you're going to go ahead and give it a whirl. So, uh, step one, uh, get out your phone, go to that webpage, therailproject.com, add it to your home screen. Um, the app looks beautiful right next to the iNaturalist and your Merlin Bird ID. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, if you're curious what the Gamma's fasciatus looks like, um, I put it as our logo because I'm slightly obsessed with that, Scott. Um, but anyways, once you get on there, once you get on there, um, how simple it is. So I'm just going to walk you through some screenshots and we're going to actually identify an invertebrate. Uh, you click on enter sample. After you click on enter sample, give you guys a moment. You go ahead and I do need some information about the stream, uh, especially the GPS coordinates, uh, your contact information. It doesn't go out anywhere. It just goes on to my larger data set. So if I have a question, I can just email you and whatnot. Um, I need the stream name. Um, the uh, drainage basin that you're in, if you don't know it, that's totally fine. Um, the smaller immediate drainage, if you don't know it, that's fine. But basically if it's starred, I need that information. So the date, the GPS location, I don't know my GPS location. Uh, you just click on uh, view map, find yourself on the map, pinpoint yourself right there and it automatically fills in uh, the GPS coordinates. So then every bit of data that you collect, I have the it coordinated uh, for Google map overlays and whatnot that we're gonna be working on with this app. So, you caught your invertebrates. How do I identify it? Um, if you already, if you got a background in, in entomology, you can just click on the by name and then you can start typing in the invertebrate family name 
or their common name. Um, I set up the database to uh, cover about every aquatic macroinvertebrate in North America. Um, and then also they're listed by their common name too. Um, so once you got that, click it, and then you're just gonna put in however many uh, you have. Okay, I don't know my invertebrate family names. I don't know the common name. I just have this really, really cool invertebrate, but I have no idea what it is. I resolve that issue for you too. So if you don't know it, hit selector. And this is a very, very, very detailed um, dichotomous key that I created. It has 3D stacked high resolution images of each macroinvertebrate found in North America. So the next slides, I'm just gonna walk you through it. So click on by selector. Okay, in this case, all right, oh shoot, okay, well, uh, there's observable tails or hooks. I don't know what tails or hooks are. You click on the information thing, and again, I have high resolution images defining those structures for you. So it's really no excuse not to be able to identify it. So let's go ahead and give this a whirl. If you guys have the app open, I'm gonna open mine and walk you on through it. Um, I'm not gonna um, spoil this one for you, but um, if you have the app, Desmond, you got it? If you do, um, go ahead and let's uh, let's go on through. So looking at this, um, scrolling down to by selector, because I don't know the name. So looking at this, how many jointed legs do you see on this? Kate, welcome. If you want to answer too, how many jointed legs do you have? Um six is it six okay so looking at the app zero six eight ten plus i got six legs so i click on that and then it brings me to the next uh question um does it have a portable case i have no idea what a portable case is you click on the information and it'll show you so do you see a portable case Mm. I'm not in the app, so I don't know. Looking at looking at the invertebrate, do you see a port a case, something that it made out of rocks or wood or something? Plant matter. Kate's nodding her head. No. Uh, nope, no portable case. All right. What about wing pads? Now, I don't know what wing pads are. Um, wing pads. So if you click on the information. I define it for you, and I got 3D stacked images of what those structures are. And the wing pads, in this case, this guy does have wing pads for time's sake. Um, these here, they will, when this thing does immediately, it will have its, um, its full grown wings. So this guy does have wings. Okay, the next question. Does it have tail filaments? Now, if you don't know what tail filaments are, again, I just put the images. So do you see tails on this? Yeah. Yep, I do. Mm -hmm. All right. What about dorsal gills or lateral abdominal gills? Now, the abdomen, it's right here. I don't know what lateral gills or dorsal gills are. Again, you click on the information and it shows you. Do you see any gills on this? Is it those spikes on the side there? Not the spikes, not the spikes. Not the spikes. But to note on this guy, if you look carefully, he's got hairy armpits. Those are actually his gills there. Um, no, uh, no lateral gills. Okay. Next question is, how many tails? Two or three? Mm, two? Is it two? Yep. It's got two tails. One, two. Clicking on it. Right there, it tells me I've got some sort of stonefly, some sort of a, the order Plicotera. And looking at that, now just a matter of going through all the Plicoteras and which one does it match with. Okay. And um, 
what you have is, yep. Do you find it, Kate? What is it? The peltoperlidae. Pelto, yep, peltoperlidae, <laughs> the roach-like stonefly is what you have there. <laughs> so that's it. It's really, really that simple. Now, Kate, uh, just for uh, a disclaimer, do you do you have a background in entomology at all, Kate? No. No. Okay. Cool. Cool. Excellent. So now once you get all of that and you've ran through your sample and this is as you're adding it, you hit um, add number of that and it builds your taxa uh, catalog up and you're like, oh man, another peltoperlidae. You can just add another number. No big deal. Super easy. And then when you're done, you hit submit. And this is the cool part. I um, programmed this app so that if an invertebrate can tell you anything about the water, it will tell you about the water. Um, it's gonna give you color-coded um, reports of your findings for your stream condition, your water quality index, so your stream condition is, well, what's the, the land around it? Could it play an impact on uh, the ecology in the stream or in your drainage ditch, whatever you're looking at? Um, the water quality index, how clear is that water? Um, the tax index, your EPT index, that is used to also show your water quality. It's the Fematerra, Plecoterra, and Trichoterra. So it looks at your, your um, caddis flies, your mayflies, and your stone flies. And because they all need good, highly oxygenated water. So if you have a good EPT, you got clean water. Um, the EPT abundance, um, the Hills and Off Biotic Index, it's another water quality assessment, um, and the Simpson Biodiversity Index. So this will give you um, a number between zero and one. And if you're not familiar with the Simpson Biodiversity Index, it's used by um, your um, government agencies to identify um, biodiversity, but that Think of it like probability. You want to have a more diverse system is closer to zero. Um, so think of like blindly reaching into a bag. So like in the case of the um, of this report, I have a Simpson index of 0.15. So you have, if you were to blindly reach in there, you have like a 15% chance of pulling out the same species which means you have a very, very, very biodiverse system. It's good. If you got something like one, it's got no biodiversity. You have a hundred percent chance of pulling out the same species, the same species, the same species. Um, the next page of the report, it goes into your taxa catalog as well as the um, explanation of the feeding groups. Why do I need to know about my feeding groups? Because then back on the first page, you see the ecosystem attributes. And that's all the nutrient modeling piece. Where does the system come from uh, in regards to energy? Is it dependent on leaf litter, like a heterotrophic system? Is it uh, dependent on the sunlight and your in-stream uh, plant matter growing, an autotrophic system. This identifies it for you, uh, CPOM, FPOM index. When the food falls in, how long does it take to condition? Uh, the TFPOM, BFPOM index, that stands for transported fine particulate organic matter or benthic uh, fine particulate organic matter. And if it's in transport, it's going to indicate we have fast moving water. If it's benthic, we've got cool, slow moving water. Um, channel stability index. Uh, this goes back into when I was uh, telling you, oh, if I got this invertebrate, it's going to indicate that I probably have a sandy stream or maybe it's got large cobble and whatnot. So the channel stability index that goes in looking at how susceptible that channel is to certain disturbances and erosion, um, this indicates it based on the feeding behavior of the invertebrates, like your filtering collectors and scrapers. They both need hard surfaces. Top-down predator control index, that is simply looking at, well, your predators have to eat. So what they eat, do they have a short life cycle or do they have a long life cycle? If you know anything about R-selected and K-selected species, your R selected species, they typically, they have a short, short, short life cycle and they reproduce a ton as opposed to your K selected species. They have a longer life cycle and they make fewer offspring. This indicates 
whether that system is dependent on um, the predators are dependent on uh, organisms that have a short life cycle or a long life cycle. Cool. I could just give you numbers here, but uh, for the user and for the students, on the third page, I walk you through all of the math, how your numbers fall in and why you got the number that you did. And then it gives you, okay, well, what does my number mean? So on the right-hand side, it goes into each metric has its rubric uh, to assess what you did. And now if you're like, well, cool, I got these numbers, I saw how you did it, but I have no idea what the EPT um, abundance is. I don't know what the Hilsenoff Biotic Index is. The final page of this report will define it all for you. Uh, so again, it's a nice detailed um, five page report. Yes, that anybody can just go ahead and access and all everyone's um, results are public access after I go through and peer review it. Um, right now we're working on a larger, larger $100,000 grant to make the database more interactive. So if Desmond wants to plug in PFAS numbers and whatnot and see if there's a correlation between the PFAS of this stream and the invertebrates of this stream or the specific um, population of, well, how many hydrocycids did we find in uh, the Benton Harbor and um, Bering Springs area? Click on it, color codes it for you. And then if he wants to lay those metrics up against something he wants to plug in, uh, he has the option to do that. So that's in the works right now. I'm uh, just got to start it on that EPA uh, grant. But Desmond, that's the rail project in a nutshell. Um, anything else? Well, that's good. I mean, it's very useful information. Uh, something that one of the things we really want to Im impress upon people in Environmental Fridays is not just to learn about things, you know, having the awareness, but also putting it into action. And that's what you gave us today with yep. this app and the rail project. And so Kate, is that how you pronounce your name, Kate? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, Kate came on, she was persistent. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, she came on and she, could you just introduce yourself and maybe if you have comments or questions? Sure. So um, I'm Kate Marie and I um, work as a math and science consultant at our ISD here in Jackson County, Michigan. Um, and um, I actually was at a SEMIS conference yesterday talking about place-based education and, and we were, you know, talking about water and how ubiquitous it is and just, you know, finding ways with water to get our kids involved um, in place-based education. And um, so it's exciting to be on today. And um, this is a resource that I know some of our teachers will use because they're, you know, um, yeah, looking to make some, some um, strides with, Eco justice in our areas, and you know, looking at water quality and those kinds of things. So, I'm excited to share this with them. Um, so, this is a new job for me. I just came out of a second grade classroom, so I'm excited to be um, getting this information and then passing it back out to mm -hmm. science teachers and getting to learn along with them. So, awesome. Are so, you going to um, be at the place based conference next month in Grand Rapids? Um, I'm hoping so. Yeah, it's okay, on my calendar. Sign up. Sign yeah. up for my workshop. Okay, I will. Yeah, yeah I was going to ask if you were going to be there. That's yeah, exciting. we'll be looking yeah. at looking at invertebrates. Um, Yay! Okay. Yep. Yeah, and even cool. before that, today you could you guys could you know connect um, online and chat and all of that. So yeah. that would be a really good um, you know networking connection here. So yeah. um, the I have a question, maybe like a comment about the use of the macro invertebrates. I'm assuming, I'm assuming, I don't know too much about the biology and stuff of them, but I'm assuming that they contain a lot of lipids, the fat, they are fatty. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and so a lot of um, organic pollutants would then be able to very easily absorb in them 
right? Yeah. I that. you would you would imagine, um, but Desmond, to be honest, I I'm not entirely sure. I mean, so um, when you're using them to indicate water quality, um, that water quality index score in macroinvertebrates, it's kind of um, it's very vague, but basically it goes under the assumption that polluted water is typically going to have a low dissolved oxygen level. And so the um, PTI score, the pollution tolerance index score per each macroinvertebrate is assessed based on how well that invertebrate family can tolerate a particular dissolved oxygen level. Right, but what I'm saying yeah. is because of, you know, it's a good assumption that they contain a significant amount of lipid yeah. um, as part of their, you know, Con, uh, composition, then it would I would assume that they could also be tested for organic pollutants because the organic pollutants will absorb, you know, fairly readily yeah. in the lipid la layers. So that could be another added. And organic pollutants would include PFAS. Yeah. Uh, you know, both fluorinated and non-fluorinated organic pollutants. And so using the macroinvertebrates um, to estimate um, at least their exposure to organic pollutants would be another piece that uh, could be looked at with this. I, I would imagine so. Yeah, that um, my my work in uh, in grad school is mostly um, uh, nutrient um, modeling with invertebrates and mm -hmm. such. Um, but yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, it does. And so I could, like we were saying before the lecture, I could connect you with the professor at the University of um, Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. uh, he's in the area specifically of, you know, PFAS. Yeah. But um, we could try to find other persons that might be able to look into or are looking into organic pollutants in aqueous systems. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds fun. I have another That's... avenue to take the rail project. It's always evolving. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So um, this has been really good. And I thank you. You came on on the last minute when. Yep. Our previous uh, speaker couldn't uh, make it. Uh, we want to thank you so very much for doing that. Uh, with Kate, um, we will establish connections here too and thank keep you. you updated. If all goes thank well, if all goes well, next week, Friday, our topic is going to try to be connected to World Food Day. World Food Day is October 16th. And I've been trying to get a speaker, it's not nailed down yet, <laughs> that would talk about that, which is a, a major problem across the world um, in terms of, uh, even within our state of Michigan, there are lots of uh, islands of food insecurity. Um, there is the topic of regenerative agriculture. So there are many different aspects to the World Food Day that I think would also appeal to you and your students. Um, so that's what we have planned for next week. We'll see if it works right. out. <laughs> Excellent. Great, Excellent. thank you. Well, thank, thank you, you Jasmine. Oh, Yo, yeah. you bet, Kate. I'll see you next month. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. All right, All right. bring your waiters. All right. Okay. Bye. All right, take care. All right. All right, have a good weekend. Good. You too, you too. Thanks. Okay, bye-bye. Good luck. All right. <laughs>